this is On My Nightstand, and I am Laura Cathcart Robbins. And today I'm reading from a book by Laura Davis. Um, it's called The Burning Light of Two Stars. And I'm reading um, from chapter 24, which is called Disclosure. And I'm just going to give you a little bit about Laura. Uh, Laura Davis is the author of six groundbreaking nonfiction books that have sold more than 1.8 million copies around the world. Uh, her classic bestsellers, The Courage to Heal and The Courage to Heal Workbook, paved the way for hundreds and thousands of women and men to heal from the trauma of sexual abuse. So that's just a little bit about her. Her biography is much longer than that, and you can check that out when you buy the book yourself. Um, so yeah, I said that the chapter I'm reading from is called Disclosure. Um, this is a book where uh, Laura, who's 28 at the time, this is a memoir, so this is not a novel, um, she has had incest memories come to her for the first time. She's remembering instances of incest when she was a child for the first time. And she wants to tell her mother about it, but she's really scared to. So she's been avoiding her. And her mother has gotten worried to the point where uh, she lives across the country from Laura. But she's basically said she's coming to where Laura is because she's so worried. And uh, Laura would like to preempt that by telling her over the phone. So here we go. The next day, I spent my lunch hour whispering into my phone at work, having an emergency strategy session with my therapist. That night, I got home before my roommates. It was 6 o'clock in California, 9 o'clock in New Jersey. I holed up in my bedroom, pulled my princess phone onto my lap slipped my forefinger into the round dial and called mom's number, the number I grew up with, the one I knew by heart. As the phone rang, I imagined her in front of the TV, watching Masterpiece Theater, wearing a silky robe, a glass of wine in one hand, a parliament in the other. It'll be okay, it'll be okay, I chanted, as I waited for her to pick up. Please say, darling, I'm so sorry. You're going to get through this, trust me. I'll be here every step of the way. I was sitting on the hard tufted mattress I'd splurged on at Futon Shop in San Francisco, pressed against the backboard of my plywood and cinder block bed. Unanswered rings echoed in my ear. Should I hang up? There's still time. I imagine Mom showing up on my doorstep. I have to tell her. She needs to know. I let the phone ring. Please, please, please. She picked up on the sixth ring. Lori, darling, is that you? The moment I heard her voice, everything went loose and wobbly inside. It's so good to finally talk to you. I wrapped my finger into t I wrapped my finger into the tight curl of the phone cord. This is it. I just have to say it, but I can't. Lori, Lori, are you there? Beneath her eager voice, I heard the strike of a match on a matchbook cover, a deep inhale. Sounds I'd known and hated for a lifetime. All those cigarette warning labels Paul and I had tacked up on our parents' door. The pack I crumbled into the toilet when I was eight. The day I sat down next to her in the den on the flat brown couch, the one covered with a Mexican serape, picked up one of her cigarettes and lit up. I was 14, and there was nothing she could say or do. I already knew how to inhale. I imagine her sitting on that serape now, the blue ceramic ashtray I'd made for her for Mother's Day, heaped with spent parliaments, lipstick ringing the filters. I heard her take another drag. This is it. Mom, I have something to tell you. My voice, a miserable squeak. Damn it. Why do I have to sound like such a pitiful child? Worry pierced tiny holes in the warmth of her voice. What is it, darling? What's wrong? She waited for me to speak. I looked around my room, searching for something, anything to anchor me, to remind me I was real. My gaze fell on an old door from Goodwill on top of two sawhorses. Dad had driven over from Project Artoud to help me drag it up from the corner of Masonic and Haight. I have a desk, my new Mac i28 and my dot matrix printer. I have a computer. Next to my bed, a plastic crate on its side full of my favorite books. I am a reader. 
on the floor next to my bed an anthology of lesbian love poems inscribed with a loving note from Gwen. I have a girlfriend. My journal with a pen clipped to the front. I am a writer. I should have written to Mom instead. How can I possibly say these words out loud? I grabbed my white teddy bear from under the sheets and hugged it to my chest. It's now or never. Mom? I can't say it. I just can't. I pictured my therapist's face, Gwen's steady countenance, her voice. Sweetheart, you can do this. I tried again. Mom, when I was a little girl, but my voice stalled. Laurie, what is it, darling? Her voice pulsed with warmth and encouragement. You can tell me anything. I dug my fingers into the white plush of my bear and forced the words out through tight lips. When I was a little girl, I was molested. It's out. I can't take it back. What did you say? Shock waves reverberated across the miles between us. I let Mom's question hang in the air, saying it was bad enough. She took a drag on her cigarette. Her voice was firmer this time, insistent. Lori, what did you just say? A siren ripped down the street, heading to an emergency. I have to answer. I always have to answer, Mom. I pulled my knees closer and mumbled my response. I was molested. She said nothing. A second siren, then a third raced by. Somewhere, something terrible was happening. I fell into Mom's silence and kept falling. I should never have told her. Mom crooned the ancient song of mothers comforting their children. Oh, my God. Or, oh, honey. Or something like that. But I couldn't hear because of the rushing in my ears. I shut my eyes, floated out of my body. Darling, I'm so sorry. Did she just say she was sorry? My God, she believes me. I don't have to face this alone. I snapped back into my body and the room came back into focus. My desk, my computer, my bed, my books, my weight on the bed. I was right to tell her. It's all going to be okay. I can depend on mom. The front door slammed, my housemates arriving from work. Soon the kitchen would be filled with their chatter. Mom's voice rolled toward me like a soft caress. Lori, are you okay? Pressure built up behind my eyes. I struggled to control my voice. I'm having a really hard time. Do you remember what the doctor told me about you when you were born? I knew what she was going to say, but I wanted to hear it again. Tell me. He said, if you lived, you'd be stronger than most babies. Vicky didn't make it, but you did. You were stronger. You are stronger. You're going to get through this. Cabinets opened and closed in the kitchen on the far side of the wall. Cooking sounds, the thwack of a knife on wood, the sizzle of oil, the smell of garlic in a pan. When I got off the phone, something warm and delicious would be waiting. Mom sighed. Darling, I know this is terrible for you. Take all the time you need to tell me. When she said that, the lightning bolts in my chest disappeared. Blood streamed back into my hands and feet. The sirens faded into the distance. This was going much better than the scenarios I'd rehearsed with my therapist. I remember her advice. Don't say anything you don't want to say. Keep control of the conversation. This call is for you. But I don't have to worry about that now. I told Mom, and she's showing up for me. I couldn't wait to tell my therapist. I stretched out my legs, released my teddy bear back onto the bed, took a deep breath. But I still hadn't told Mom the hardest part, and I don't think I can. The knot in my stomach returned. I wiped away a few small tears. You really believe me? Her response was immediate. Of course I believe you. Why wouldn't I? You were always an honest child. The smell of curry made my stomach grumble. How can I get hungry at a time like this? A long-distance buzz hummed through the wire. Mom had stopped talking, and that couldn't be good. Or could it? My fingers traced the matted fur on my bear's face. I was hovering right on the edge of my skin. Say something, Mom. Please keep talking. Mom inhaled. I could almost hear the smoke pooling around her head. When she spoke again, her voice was different narrower, a tight wire. I knew that tight wire. 
When did this happen? I sucked myself deep into my body and put on my armor, but my armor was full of holes. If only Vicky were here, I wouldn't be doing this alone. Mom's voice thinned. Lori, tell me when. It wasn't a question. Oh, please stop. Just call me sweetheart and tell me that I'm going to be okay. Say that again, please. I reached for my therapist's words. You don't have to say anything you don't want to say. But her voice was fading. I couldn't remember her face. I was on the phone with Mom now, and I had to play by Mom's rules. I replied in a whisper. It started when I was three. Three? Yes. Three? Oh, my God, Lori. I'm so sorry, darling. She's sorry. She knows how helpless I was. This wasn't my fault, right, Mom? Did you say three? Did I hear you right? Hold on a sec. I heard Mom get up. The phone clattered into the tiny tiles of the coffee table. Then I heard nothing. A moment later, she picked up the extension in the kitchen, a yellow phone with a curly cord that stretched across the room. The hum of the refrigerator vibrated in my ear. Ice cubes clinked in a glass, a splash of liquid, the strike of a match, a long, slow inhale. Mom was trying to put it all together. Tumblers were falling in my brain, too. Like, where the fuck were you? I clenched my jaw but said nothing. I'd said too much already. A truck ground its gears out on the street, an ugly grating sound. When Mom, when Mom spoke again, hysteria lapped at the edge of her voice. When exactly did this happen? Shut up. I wanted to hang up, but I couldn't do that to Mom. I replied in a quiet voice. It went on for a very long time. In other words, it wasn't a babysitter. It wasn't a random stranger. Mom's next question started in a whisper and rose to a ragged shout. Who? Who did this to you? No. Anything but that. But if I don't tell her, she'll think it was Dad. Of course she will. It'll all, it's always the father. I can't let her think it's Dad. Laughter rippled through the wall from the kitchen, a million miles away. It wasn't Dad, I said. Well, who was it? A neighbor? A teacher? A kid at school? There was no softness in her voice now. Tell me, who was it? I forced my mouth to shape the awful, terrible words. It was Papa. What did you say? I couldn't bear to say it again. I said nothing. Did you say Papa? I nodded. Please don't make me say it again. Mom's voice drilled deep into my ear. My father? I replied in a whisper. Yes. No, Mom gasped. It can't be. She sounded like she was being strangled. Oh, I did this to her. I made a terrible mistake. Take it back. It never happened. When Mom could finally speak again, her voice was raw. This is just such a shock. Then she went silent again. I forced myself to breathe into my belly, a calming breath. Mom just needs time. I've had weeks to get used to this, and I'm not used to it at all. It's just as terrible now as when I first remembered. Worse. Mom will be back. She just needs a few minutes. I fingered the turquoise ribbon around my bear's neck, counted the seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Soon, she'll tell me how brave I am. I looked at the back of my poems Gwen gave me, my desk, my journal. Twenty Mississippi, twenty-one Mississippi. You'll be okay, darling. She'll say that again. Tightness gripped my belly, my throat, my chest. Thirty-five Mississippi. Ice clinked. Mom took another swallow, another drag. She just needs time. Fifty Mississippi. She's trying to find the right words, the perfect thing to say. Don't worry, darling. We'll get through this together, she'll say. My roommates laughed in the kitchen. She said I was an honest child. Of course she believes me. Ninety-four Mississippi. Say something, Mom, please. I held my breath. One hundred. My voice leaked out in a whisper. Mom, Mom, are you still there? When she spoke again, steel bound her voice. You were never alone with him. This wasn't something I'd practiced. I had no idea what to say, so I told her the truth. It was when we visited 
after Shabbat dinner in the back room. He'd tell me the story about the skunk in the railroad car, and the light was, you were never out of my sight. My ears pounded. I couldn't see. You don't give a shit about me. It's always about you. When I finally responded, it was in a tight, clipped voice. You know, Mom, I've been reading a lot, and according to all the studies, men don't just start molesting children when they're 70 years old. Mom's breath drew back, the ocean before a tsunami. If he did it to me, then he probably did it to... Dot, dot, dot. How dare you? Mom's voice crashed over me. Something broke inside, a fender crumbling in a collision. You were always selfish. Yes, Mom. I've always been selfish. Of course she's right. She's always right. You're a goddamn liar. If you say so, Mom, it must be true. I am a liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You only look out for yourself. I am a bad, terrible daughter. How could you do this to me? First you blame me for the divorce. Then you turn down that scholarship to Wellesley. A full scholarship. I wasn't made of money. How could you do that to me? I squeezed myself into a tighter ball. Then you ran off with that guru, that fat fuck, and you decided you were a lesbian. Mom spat out the word as, as if she could barely stand to say it. I pressed the phone against my ear, drinking in every word. Mom's rage. My lullaby. I could handle all that, all the shit you've put me through. It wasn't easy having you as a daughter, but this accusation? You couldn't have hurt me worse if you shot me. It's true, I'm an awful person, but I need you. My heart pounded like a thin-skinned drum. If only there was a light on the wall, like at Bubby's and Papa's, I could disappear. Please tell me I'm going to be okay. Just say it again. Mom's words ripped through the miles. You're ruining my life. I hope someday you have a daughter just like you. Then she hung up on me. I clutched my knees and rocked, the receiver still plastered to my ear. Click. Dial tone. Oh my God, what have I done? The little girl I kept locked away for more than 20 years finally had her say, now I was going to pay. <laughs>